Hi everybody and welcome back. In today's video we're going to be talking about the side effects of betaine HCL. This is a very commonly used supplement among people who have IBS, SIBO, GERD, all sorts of digestive complaints can be helped by betaine HCL, but the question always is, is this the right thing for you to take? And if you have a side effect from it, why might that be? We're going to dissect that in this video. Stay tuned. All right, first and foremost, let's talk about whether betaine HCL is safe or advisable for people who have EMO, intestinal methane overgrowth. Now, for those of you who are kind of oldies in this world, you might remember when this was called methane SIBO, and we might even have seen this coming up on stool testing, but just know that they kind of clump it all together now. Methane overgrowth is methane overgrowth. We think it's kind of a totally different thing as opposed to the SIBO, the bacterial overgrowth, which can produce hydrogen or hydrogen sulfide. So that being said, let's move forward and talk about whether or not this is advisable for people with EMO, because there's been a lot of talk about this more recently, whether or not it's safe or advisable, or if it's going to potentially feed the methane overgrowth itself and make you feel worse. So what I've done is I've just drawn betaine and HCL because there's just two different kind of things that I really want to touch base on in this video. The big thing to know is that you have a betaine molecule and it's bound to a hydrogen and a chloride ion. And when they get into the stomach, when they get into a solution, those two molecules dissociate and now you're left with free floating hydrogen ions and free floating chloride ions. Now, for those of you who are chemistry nerds like me, you're going to remember that the definition of an acid is having a lot of free floating hydrogen ions. So therefore, when those, those ions dissociate out into the solution, now you have a very high concentration of hydrogen ions out in the solution of the stomach, and you have this betaine kind of off doing its own thing. This is the definition of an acid. So by giving you this molecule with a very loosely bound hydrogen ion, you're giving the ability to boost up your stomach acid or lower the pH because you're giving the body, you're giving the stomach those free floating hydrogen ions, and that's what's going to make acid. Now, the way that this theory has been built, this was put forth by Dr. Mark Pimentel. He's one of the big SIBO and IBS researchers out of Cedar Sinai. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with him and his work already. But the idea that has been put forth by Dr. Pimentel is that by taking this hydrogen containing supplement, that can feed the methane producing organisms, because remember, methane is just a carbon with four hydrogens slapped on the side. So you have this molecule with one carbon centrally located and then four hydrogens around the outside. And the methanogens, the archaea that make methane, that are the problem in intestinal methane overgrowth, those archaea use hydrogen in order to make their methane. So it's the idea is that you're giving them more fuel, you're giving them more hydrogen that they can then gobble up and they can say, thank you very much. I will take that and put that on a methane molecule. Nice doing business with you. But is that actually a thing that happens? And what can we learn from both clinical experience, from chemistry and physiology? That is what I'm here to clear up for you. So if you think about the anatomy and the physiology of it all, hold on, let's see. All right, let's say here's your stomach, right? So vat of acid in that stomach, so pH of two or three, let's say. When the acidic contents of the stomach leave the stomach, your stomach is built to be able to handle that very, very acidic vat of battery acid, but your intestines are not capable of handling that. They're much more delicate. They don't have as thick and robust of a mucus layer. They don't have the protection that the stomach has in order to buffer that and keep you from essentially digesting your stomach. So the backup plan in lieu of having that physical protection is that you have chemical protection. And again, if anybody is a chemistry nerd, you're gonna remember that you can neutralize an acid with a base, right? So that's exactly what happens in the human body. So the acidic bolus of food exits the stomach and gets to the very, very, very first part of the small intestine. And that triggers a reflex in that beginning part of the small intestine and then you get the pancreas dumping in its juices and the gallbladder dumping in its juices. And everybody, especially in this field, we talk about what? Pancreatic enzymes and bile. 
And those are the two things that we think of with regards to the pancreas and the gallbladder. But what's talked about a lot less is that those two organs also excrete bicarbonate, which is a base. So it's that reflex. Your body senses the acidic contents coming out of the stomach. And in response to that, to protect the intestines, knowing that that's dangerous and caustic, it triggers a reflex that tells the pancreas and the gallbladder to release their juices, one of which is bicarbonate. And those juices neutralize the acid by the time it ever gets to the small intestine. This happens very quickly and it happens right at the tip, tip, tip top of that small intestine. So by the time you start getting into the duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum, and certainly the colon, that acid is long gone. It's been neutralized with bicarbonate way, 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 way far away, up near the stomach. So my first kind of hole in this theory is that if we're assuming that the methane overgrowth is happening in the small intestine or the colon and not in the stomach, which I have never heard of happening, as just a side note, I don't know if I just built a theory right there. I haven't heard of archaea and methane overgrowth happening in the stomach. But if we're assuming that this is happening in the intestines after this checkpoint, then the acid is long gone. The hydrogen ions have been bound up and basically turned into water by that point. So we don't have to worry about those pesky hydrogen ions feeding the methane, methane overgrowth because they've been neutralized. They've been turned into water. Because remember, water is H2O. So what you do is you get the bicarbonate coming in, you get the hydrogen coming in, chemical reaction, boom, you get water and some other molecules, I'm sure. I, I'm not uh, brushed up enough on my chemistry to tell you all of the molecules that are made. But the point is, that acid and that base come together to make water. Well, are you worried about water feeding methane overgrowth? I say that with kind of a jerk tone of voice, but in all honesty, are we worried about water? Because if that's the case, then the water that you took with the betaine HCl might be just as dangerous as the betaine HCl if we're just looking at it from a stance of a hydrogen is a hydrogen is a hydrogen. You have boatloads of hydrogen all throughout your body. We are basically machines made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. That is the vast majority of the human body. Like, I forget, some astonishing amount of the human body, like 90 plus percent of our tissues are made out of those four molecules alone. And an awful lot of it is hydrogen. So we can't fear hydrogen in and of itself. In theory, I could maybe get behind the idea of being concerned with free floating hydrogen because it's kind of like a free agent that can go wherever. But again, it's going to get bound up. It's going to get turned into water by the time it hits the intestines and before it gets to the methane producers, especially if it's in the colon. But even in the small intestine, you don't have a chance to feed the methane producers because it gets neutralized just like that. And it's no different than drinking water. So we need the acid in the stomach, but our body has protective mechanisms to make sure that the acid doesn't get down further than that. And that's a really good thing because otherwise we would get big old stinking ulcers right here and we would probably all be very miserable if we didn't have that protective mechanism. And I will share as well that this reflex of having the acidic contents exit the stomach and then the triggering of the reflex from the gallbladder and the pancreas is really huge for digestion. There are so many people who have low pancreatic enzymes or poor bile flow or poor digestion in general because they don't have enough stomach acid. And that helps trigger some of these reflexes and gets you more bang for your buck. So you might not have to take a digestive enzyme and ox bile and HCL and a brush border enzyme. You could probably just get away with taking HCL, to be honest with you, assuming that your levels might be a little bit low. So I would not write off betaine HCL as a tool for SIBO. And to what I alluded to earlier, I have found it to be very helpful. I mean, I wanted to be open-minded to this theory and I thought it was very interesting to chew on when I first heard about it, but I didn't want to write it off just because I use betaine HCL with my patients and I've had good success with it. I wanted to be open-minded to new ideas and kind of chew on it a little bit, so to speak. And this, the chemistry of it, the physiology of it, combined with my clinical experience, which is that betaine HCL could be very helpful for some people I just find this really hard to swallow. Food metaphor, very much intended. I would say that out of all my patients who have tried betaine HCL, about, I'm gonna try to give rough ballparks of numbers here. I would say for people who have IBS, SIBO, or IBD, so Crohn's or colitis, 
I would say probably 30 or 40 percent of people find that it makes a positive noticeable difference when they take betaine HCL or when they start making strides to work on their stomach acidity. About probably about 50 or so percent of people don't really feel anything different at all. They're kind of like, eh, I don't know if it's helping. I, it's not hurting, but I don't think it's helping either. And then we debate whether or not it makes sense for them to continue. And then a subset of people who already had pre-existing GERD or gastritis will feel worse, but not in the sense of IBS or SIBO symptoms. It's that the, I, the, the GERD or the gastritis gets flared up. But if you think about what happens with GERD, and I have some, some videos on this, and I have gastritis on the docket to talk about in 2022, by the way. If you think about the stomach, it's raw, it's inflamed, it's already so vulnerable to the acid that you already have. You're having a hard time coping with the amount of acidity that you have and your protective layers like the mucus layer are waning. They're not as strong. They're not as protective anymore. So now you have this increased awareness and this increased inflammation and tissue damage because of the acid that you already have. And then you add acid on top of that it's gonna flare up existing symptoms. So please, if you have GERD or if you have gastritis, do not try betaine HCL until you have fully, fully healed the GERD, the gastritis, the ulcers. Um, and I really don't think that this is wise for people with a history of Barrett's esophagus to use either as a side note. So be really cautious if you have stomach or lower esophagus, esophagus related pathology. But if you just have IBS, SIBO, you know, Crohn's colitis, celiac, if you have something from basically the duodenum down, by all means, try betaine HCL because it has been really helpful. But I do want to get into another rare subset of side effects that you can have from betaine HCL. And it has nothing to do with the HCL component of it. And it has everything to do with the betaine related component. And that's because betaine is a word that we use with reference to this supplement but it actually has a completely different name. All right, fancy editing aside, this is what betaine actually is. It's a molecule called trimethylglycine. And for those of you who have been in the health sphere to some degree, maybe you've seen some functional doctors or some naturopaths or some nutritionists, something about this might make your ears perk up. When you hear the word trimethylglycine, the thing that I want you to focus on here is this bit, methyl. And if you look, a methyl group is basically just the same thing. It's a carbon with three hydrogens instead of four. So if you look, we have one here, one here, and one here on the glycine molecule. So trimethylglycine is exactly what it sounds like. It's three methyl groups bound onto a glycine. And then this whole thing would be bound to the HCL, again, very loosely so it can dissociate but we're not focusing on the acid part of this right now. We're focusing on this. The relevance here is that, again, if you've fallen down the internet rabbit hole a bit or worked with a naturopath or a functional doctor, you might have been told that you had a methylation defect. Perhaps you were told that you had a gene mutation like MTHFR, or perhaps you have been told that you need to just work on methylation or that you're a lousy methylator for some reason. I think that oftentimes that's overblown and it's, it's, I should do a whole video on methylation, to be honest, because I think that it's a very deeply misunderstood field within my field. So we're going to table that conversation for another day. For right now, I'm going to point you toward, if you're curious and want to learn more, we have a couple of really great episodes on the IBS Freedom podcast about B vitamins. Look up those episodes and listen to those because we talk about methylation quite a lot in there. And we start dispelling some myths and talking about methylation in a more... Um, real world applicable sense that doesn't require 8,000 supplements. But that being said, methyl groups are great. This is one of the reasons why B vitamins are so important because a lot of them act as methyl donors. And then you need these methyl donors to do things like, I don't know, turn on and off genes. Pretty big deal. So that could be relevant for the entire body, every single cell in your body, because every single cell has DNA and you need to be able to control that DNA by turning on and turning off genes. So you need methyl groups to turn on genes or turn off genes. You also need them to run a lot of enzymes. You need methyl groups to make neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and get that feel-good brain chemistry. 
you need methyl groups for a lot of stuff, but here's where things get a little squirrely. This is a pretty big methyl donor. To get three methyl groups from one single molecule of betaine HCl, that's pretty big. So honestly, when I was working with methylation stuff a little bit more frequently, I reserved trimethylglycine for like the end. I was reserving that for the people who need a lot more oomph in the methylation department. And I wasn't using that with the vast majority of my methylation patients. Again, air quotes because I think there's, there's more context than I can put into this particular video. But what I've found is that some people, and it's pretty uncommon, but it is out there, some people are exceptionally sensitive to overmethylation. We had one of these people in FODMAP Freedom in the fall. She tried betaine HCL, again, something that we cover in the class, and she didn't feel quite right. I don't remember her symptoms but she wasn't feeling quite right from it. And luckily in the weekly live Q and A's, I was able to answer her questions. And I said, you know what? I think that you probably are really sensitive to methyl donors. So let's have you switch over to a different multivitamin, take this one supplement out of the regimen, take betaine HCL off the table. I don't think that's gonna be something that you're gonna use for the time being. And she felt a lot better. And for her kind of profile, I don't think that this is always standard. But sometimes the people who are really, really sensitive to methyl donors are also the people who have a lot of toxic burden or histamine clearance issues. And she had both. We found out through the process of the course that she actually had some mold exposure and she needed to do a lot more of a deep dive on mold. And we figured out that she was hella histamine intolerant and she did not know. So through those Q and A's, we were able to kind of uncover it bit by bit. But one of the things that we determined was she's really sensitive to methyl groups. So the betaine HCL might have helped her digestion, but it was making her feel like garbage. So keep your wits out for you for that. Um, like I said, I don't remember her specific symptoms off the top of my head, but I'll share two other scenarios. I've worked with a couple of other patients who we determined were exceptionally sensitive to methyl donors. One person, uh, she actually figured this out all on her own before she came to see me. And she told me about it after the fact. She said she was experimenting with good B vitamins because all of the good ones that are marketed so heavily are usually methyl folate or methyl B12. So she was trying good activated methylated B vitamins and she was having mood issues. And she said she would actually have fits of rage. And she was like, you know, at first I thought it was because I have four children and my children and my husband were pissing me off. But after a few days or maybe a week, she started realizing, no, this is atypical even for me and my life and my stressors. And she put two and two together and figured out that this is what was happening. And the idea is that because you need these methyl donors to make neurotransmitters, I think that a lot of these side effects end up being because you get a flood of new neurochemistry you get way more serotonin or way more dopamine or way more catecholamines than you're used to. And then it modifies your behavior and it modifies your brain function because of the flood of incoming neurotransmitters. With this other person in FODMAP Freedom this year, I think that for her, her reaction was a little bit more because the methyl groups really revved up her detoxification cycles and her enzymes. And I think that she was having a detox reaction because she was all of a sudden detoxifying way better at pulling a lot of crap out of storage. So that's the other kind of flavor. But the other one that I've seen, um, this woman was very sensitive to a lot of supplements and a lot of medications. She was telling me that she had to have a medical alert bracelet because she could not handle normal doses of things. She always had to have the doctors give her the lowest possible dose of whatever drug they were planning to give her because it would make her really, really sick. So we had talked quite a bit about, yeah, I think that you're kind of a sluggish detoxifier and we need to support that, but we have to be careful so that we don't overwhelm your body. And I remember I told her, I said, now I want you to take one pill of this multivitamin home. It was one of the ones from Seeking Health that has a little bit of methyl donor in it, but not a ton. It was 50-50 split between methylated and non-methylated. And I told her, take this one pill home tell your husband to keep an eye out for anything weird because we were kind of anticipating that this might happen. I said, have your husband watch you for anything weird behavior wise or brain wise. Take this one multivitamin just for one day and see how you do with it and report back to me. And she said it was the damnedest thing. She said she was packing for a 
uh, a three-day weekend with a friend. They were going to the Outer Banks, and she was packing for that couple-day weekend trip, and she said she totally zoned out, and then all of a sudden, like an hour or two later, she kind of came back, and she realized that she had packed 32 pairs of underwear and one t-shirt for her three-day long weekend vacation. And she kind of, she came to and was like, oh my God, like this doesn't make sense at all. So for her, it made her really space cadet and really like zoned out. And she does not have memories of that hour or two that she was packing her suitcase. Uh, I think her husband was in the other room, so he didn't really observe any odd behavior, but she was clearly a space cadet packing 32 pairs of underwear and one t-shirt for her overnight trip. So that being said, like I said, the two flavors of side effects to genuinely watch out for. Again, they're both pretty uncommon, but keep your eyes peeled anyway. The two things is watch for it to mess with your neurotransmitters because you might find yourself making a lot more serotonin or a lot more dopamine or a lot more catecholamines all in the moment. And that can be a lot for some people to handle, in which case you want to maybe steer clear of ex excessive methyl donors and methyl B vitamins and might want to do something non-methylated um, and then like gradually introduce them over time. The other thing is that if you have a, a body that is burdened by a lot of toxic burden, like mold or you know chemical exposure, or if you know that you're exceptionally chemically sensitive, like that patient who just metabolizes drugs really slowly and needs really low doses of everything, keep your eyes peeled for a sort of a detox reaction. It's going to look like a Herxing reaction, but it's probably from detoxing. Pardon me. It's probably because you're pushing your detox pathways way quicker than you're used to, and you're pulling a bunch of crap out of storage and dumping it into circulation, and then that's making you feel crappy. So you can keep your eyes peeled for this. In my opinion, this type of side effect, for all that it's rare, is a much bigger concern than the hypothetical feeding of the methanogen thing. I really do not think that that stands the test of chemistry and physiology and anatomy. I don't think that that makes a lick of sense. And like I said, I have found people with EBO and SIBO and IBS and IBD to do very well with betaine HCL for the sake of digestive support. Um, like I said, just be really cautious and don't take it until you have healed any existing GERD, gastritis, ulcers, or Barrett's. If you have a history of one of those four, I would caution you to maybe not uh, write it off entirely, but if you're going to take betaine HCL, please work with a professional work with somebody who can monitor you and can help you troubleshoot and make sure that you're taking it in an appropriate, responsible, safe way. Because there is a very real risk that you're gonna flame out your stomach and make your stomach feel worse if you take too much too soon. But guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that this provided some clarity. I know it's kind of confusing talking about the, the couple of different types of reactions, but I really hope that this was helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you in the next video here on the Triangle Holistic Gut Health channel. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.